Um, right, so my name's Sam Ansell and I work for uh, an organisation called the Coppice Co-op. We're a workers' co-op of coppices and woodland workers based in Arnside and Silverdale. Uh, we've got a stall up there, so if at any point, today, like later today or tomorrow, you want to come up and say hi, that's where we are. Um, I also am an associate lecturer at um, the University of Cumbria on the forestry course, so I teach some practical forest skills with the students there. Um, so yeah, the focus of the chat today is about charcoal. Um, obviously it's just sort of my experience and approach to sort of charcoal making and production and what I've picked up over the years. Um, so yeah, I'll just sort of um, chat away and if anybody's got any questions about anything at any point, just, just shout or raise a hand. So charcoal is obviously a very familiar product to most people. Um, if you, you know, if you, even if you've just had a bonfire, you'll find embers in there, charcoal in there. Um, so, it, you know, it can be as simple as that. Um, uh, there are different stages to basically heating of wood. Uh, and by kind of manipulating those stages, we can, can get either, a, you know, a higher or lesser grade of charcoal out of it. So um, if you imagine your, your little bonfire, when you're heating wood initially, um, you're getting a lot of smoke and steam, so anything, any smoke that's white is going to be like mostly steam in it, and that's moisture in the wood getting driven off by the heat that's being applied. Uh, and then you see flames. The flames element is um, when that wood is starting to break down, it starts to release volatile gases and um, uh, kind of tars, complex hydrocarbons, and those burst into flames. So that's the gas stage of it. Um, and then when, once your little fire has been going for a while, you'll notice that the, the wood has then turned black and or it's turned into embers and that's charcoal, so that's the carbon that's left over. Once you've driven off the moisture, you've driven off the, the gases, you're left with carbon. If you keep on burning it, you're left with ash. Um, but there are ways that you can manipulate fire and heat and wood in order to kind of you know, make, make charcoal. Uh, and the technical word for that is pyrolysis, making charcoal and that is heating wood in a low oxygen environment. And that, the heat does all of the driving off the moisture, driving off the gases, but depriving the fire of oxygen is what stops that carbon then combusting. Um, so that's how we get charcoal, uh, but there's, you know, a lot, there's more to it than that. Um, you know, charcoal's got a long history uh, ever since people have been using fire, they've been also using charcoal for various different things. And kind of, you know, obviously human beings have manipulated fire in very complex ways for, you know, tens of thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years. Um, but charcoal specific is, you know, sort of a, a, the kind of one of the main interests in human use of charcoal was related to metallurgy. So when people started realizing that you could heat metal copper, bronze, and then iron, and you know, manipulate it, combine it, make tools, make weapons out of it. Charcoal was a really key part of that. And the reason for that is because you can maintain a much higher temperature with a charcoal fire than you can from a fire with just wood. Um, also, because a lot of the impurities have been driven off, it's a much more, more pure thing, so you don't get so much contamination in the metal. So it, from, from, from you know, early Bronze Age or even before people were using charcoal, producing charcoal on, a, on, a, you know, on an industrial scale to work metal. Um, in the Lake District, the um, charcoal has got a really kind of strong connection with the early Industrial Revolution and the Lake District was a, was a real centre of the early Industrial Revolution. Um, and so charcoal was being made on a massive scale, particularly in the South Lakes, uh, sort of Furnace Peninsula way. And that was because there was a lot of industry. There was a lot of iron foundries, a lot of iron works. There was also chemical works, dye works, all these kind of things that required char large volumes of charcoal. Um, so, uh, and agriculture as well. And that's a really important feature historically of, of this uh, this landscape, limestone, is the lime kilns. So all are dotted all around this kind of limestone area, there's lime kilns, and those you initially used charcoal combined with lime to make quick lime or lime as, an, as a sort of agricultural soil improver. Um, so the woods around these ways have been 
been managed for with you know with charcoal in mind for a long long time. Um, so yeah, um, there was a period in the sort of later industrial revolution where um, charcoal was replaced by coal. So when the canals came in and the trains came in and actually it became you know cheaper to ship coal from the kind of north north and northwest. Um, northeast Newcastle or, 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 or even the west coast of Cumbria, the kind of charcoal production sort of started to dwindle a little bit from a kind of from a peak. Um, but there were certain industries where coal couldn't replace charcoal, most particularly gunpowder making. So really high quality of charcoal is required to make gunpowder, and specifically people were favouring charcoal made from alder trees because uh, the charcoal made from alder trees could be ground to an incredibly fine and consistent powder which is what you need for gunpowder, um, apparently. Um, so, yeah, uh, there was still a very active charcoal industry in the UK up until the 1930s, 1940s. I've seen old photographs of big factories that were producing charcoal on a really commercial scale. There was one, one factory that was loading up, lo like that had a train system of loading up like train like wood onto a train and then driving the train into a kiln converting charcoal in that way um but by that time a lot of the industrial applications were were also related to the charcoal byproducts so the tars and the solvents that can be got from the charcoal making process um and uh, so yeah, it was, there were a lot of sort of chemicals and, and uh, sort of um, interest in that, and the charcoal had almost become a byproduct. Um, however, the big change for that was the was you know World War Two and the petrochemical revolution really, um, and people starting to be able to use oil uh, to get solvents and chemicals, and, and a lot a lot of what you know what did come from charcoal was replaced by petrochemicals. Um, so that's a bit of a kind of historical overview. Um, in terms of uh, the different methods of producing charcoal, kind of related to that historical overview, way back in the day it was produced in what we call earth clamps or earth kilns. So that's a nice neat stack of wood um, covered over with a fine layer of vegetation and silt or earth or turf, anything that will create an air barrier, um, and then lit with a little chimney and then that's introducing the heat by the fire inside, but it's doing it in a low oxygen environment. Um, and that was traditionally done by groups of charcoal burners who would seasonally move around the woods, going from one wood to another, burning the charcoal, um, making charcoal uh, you know, over from wood that was felled in a previous year or a previous season. Often families doing it, often kind of itinerants working you know, traveling um, gypsies, you know, were often engaged in that kind of work. And there were also, um, you know, there's evidence of lots of little charcoal herners butts, uh, charcoal, but herners butts, charcoal burners huts. <laughs> you might be able to see butt prints somewhere. I don't know, maybe if you're a really good archaeologist. Um, so, yeah, so people were making it that way. That is a very um, skillful method of making charcoal. And unfortunately, there's that we've lost the continuous tradition of knowledge for how to do that. So there are people using earth burns these days in this country, but um, they're still figuring out how it was done um, and kind of with, with mixed results, but it's interesting to experiment. Uh, in the sort of um, Victorian period, um, people started introducing what we call ring kilns. So those are steel, big steel drums. And uh, the wood is piled into the drum there's a lid on it, there's chimneys, you can restrict the airflow so you can get that heat in the low oxygen environment, you can make charcoal that way. And that's the way that charcoal is most commonly made in the UK today on a small scale. Um, the main advantage to that is just uh, labour saving. It's a lot of work tending a, a big smoking pile of, of, uh, you know, of mud and wood in the woods. Some of the earth burns took seven to ten days to complete and they need to be constantly managed. So there, there, there isn't necessarily that much of a difference in terms of yield, but uh, you know, or quality of charcoal. But with a ring kiln, one person can manage several ring kilns, and just you know, the economies of labour were, were evident. Um, 
So that's how most charcoal is made on a small scale by kind of small, you know, most charcoal in the UK is made by small, like, you know, local producers running a couple of ring kilns. Um, but the, the, um, the, the approach that's kind of becoming more common now and around which there's a lot of interest is using a retort. So we've had the retort, the Coppice Carp has had our retort up there, you may have seen it today. Um, and the idea of that is that you have an inner chamber and an outer chamber and the wood that's sealed within the inner chamber is heated by an external source. So there's a firebox underneath. As that wood heats, it does the whole thing of releasing moisture, releasing gases. Once it gets to the point where it's releasing volatile gases, those gases get piped back round into the firebox and combust, which continues to provide the heat to drive the reaction. We've got a spider. <laughs> um, so it's more efficient um, because you're not wasting, you're using waste wood to generate the heat and then you're using waste gas to generate the heat um, and it's also much better for the environment and um, when you make charcoal in a traditional way you're pumping a lot of um, methane and greenhouse gases and you know hydrocarbons up into the, up into the atmosphere. Um, you know, the idea is that if the woodlands are locally, you know, if there's any CO2 that's going up, if the woodlands are being sustainably managed, then whatever CO2 is being released should be being absorbed by other trees that are being grown from a sustainably managed setup. But, um, but methane is obviously a lot more of a, a problematic or, you know, short term problem. Um, and also, there's a lot of people that are concerned about, um, you know, atmospheric pollution and, you know, complex hydrocarbons and particulates busting up into the air. Um, so uh, as the co Coppers Co-op, we felt that it was important to try and investigate ways that we could make charcoal more sustainably. So we've, we've converted over to the retort. Um, so, yeah, uh, what is the, uh, yeah. Let's think. So what is the relevance of charcoal uh, to coppicing and to woodland management? So um, historically, obviously, we've talked about the industrial need for large amounts of charcoal and a really good way to produce a really large yield of wood, woody biomass is to manage your woodland as coppice. Um, so back when there was huge demand, it made a lot of sense to manage woodland intensively as coppice to generate large volumes of wood on short cycles to kind of feed the industry. So a lot of coppicing, well, you know, a lot of coppicing result, you know, resulted from that. Um, uh, so, in a more modern perspective, um, charcoal is relevant to the kind of, uh, well, it, it, it ties in quite closely with coppicing still, um, but the coppicing scene now is that what we what we kind of describe it as a coppice revival. We kind of lost that continuous. Uh, you know, need to coppice woodlands for resources in the kind of, you know, around about the Second World War, 1950s, there was very little coppice being cut anymore. But people started to realise that that had big problems for the ecology of our woodlands. Um, so uh, I won't talk about that too much now because I'll be talking about that tomorrow morning. Um, but, uh, you know, with the resurgence in interest in coppicing, there was an, 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 a necessary resurgence in interest in markets for coppice products and what to do with the wood, how to generate income, and charcoal fits in really nicely with that. Um, one of the reasons it fits in really nicely with that is that you can make charcoal out of what would otherwise be quite low value wood, um, wood that isn't, is not, it's all hardwood that we use, but maybe wood that's a bit awkward for firewood that's not quite the right size, um, maybe woodlands where there's very difficult access for extraction, but you could get a kiln in, convert it into charcoal, which is a light product, which can just be handled out of the wood. Um, so it, yeah, it, particularly for coppice restoration, it's, it's, a, it's a good way to add value. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of interest in it from that. Um, so yeah, the product itself, um, the, here's a little bag. That's barbecue charcoal. So most of the charcoal that the Coppice Co-op um, produces is barbecue charcoal. Um, and one of the reasons that uh, we feel like it's important to supply barbecue charcoal locally is that 90% of barbecue that's used in the UK is imported. Um, and some of it's imported from 
places that have you know uncertain woodland management practices. I'm not saying it's all from negative woodland management, but it, it's hard to tell, and um, it's generally a safe bet to stay local um, where you can. So we feel like it's important to provide a, a local alternative for people that don't want to import charcoal. Um, and it's also an extremely high quality product uh, compared to imported charcoal. I mean, I would say that. I made it, you know, <laughs> I'm trying to sell it. Uh, but um, there's, it's generally recognised amongst sort of uh, barbecue aficionados that it, it does, it works really well. It lights quickly, it's very low in smoke. It gets the temperature really fast. It's very sort of flexible. Um, and the other great advantage of it is it, it has no additives. Or is it additives? Okay, I never get that one right. Um, so the interesting fact about um, imported charcoal is that in order to ship it in a container, um, before they can ship it in a container, or the cheapest way to ship it in a container is to ship it in the hold of a cargo boat. And in order to store it in the hold, it needs to be non-flammable. So in order to make it, make it non-flammable, they cover it in flame retardant, chemical flame retardant. And then when it gets off the boat at this end, they cover it in chemical flame accelerant so that it lights again. So most charcoal that you buy from a shop is doused heavily in unknown chemicals, which then is obviously kind of, you know, potentially tainting your food. So, so yeah, there's, a, there's good reasons to buy it. And also, you're supporting your local coppice worker or small woodland worker. Um, so, another charcoal product that we sell uh, is something called biochar. I don't know whether any of you come across biochar, um, but it's um, uh, and a really interesting and exciting new kind of approach to charcoal and what we can do with it. Uh, the essence of it is is that it's adding. Um, uh, carbon, like charge, car charge, biomass of some kind. It doesn't have to be wood. It could be, um, you know, uh, arisings, for coconut shells, or any kind of woody biomass. Um, converting it into charcoal, and then charging it with nutrients and water, uh, and preferably some form of kind of microbiome as well, and then adding it to the soil. Um, the idea behind it is that charcoal, hang on, I've got, I maybe have my little comfort piece of charcoal in my pocket that I never leave home without. So um, charcoal has the same structure as wood, and wood structure is basically loads and loads of tiny tubes, incredible amounts of tiny tubes. And when you convert it into charcoal, you stabilize it so it doesn't rot in the same way. Um, but it still has that same internal structure. And that internal structure can um, retain moisture, water, and it can release it. Um, it can also critically create a vast area, surface area which microorganisms love to inhabit. Um, so, um, if there's, uh, so it, yeah, there's been loads of research on it, and essentially it's a really good thing to add to soil. Um, it really helps soil health, it really helps increase the microbiome, um, it really helps with water retention and release and that's kind of, that's not contested anymore, that's pretty much solid research that, that is generally agreed on. Um, the reason it needs to be charged though is that um, if you add it raw to soil, so without it having microorganisms added or nutrients added or water added, then it can, in the short term, it, it re removes those things from the soil. So you don't want to add it raw. So a small it's small pieces as well, smaller than this usually. Um, so what we at the Coppice Co-op produce is charcoal fines. So that's just raw charcoal in small chip form. And then it, that's the kind of precursor to biochar. It can then be added to to make biochar. So it's a really good soil improver. The other thing um, that's received a lot of attention about biochar is the possibility to use it for climate change mitigation. So... Um, when you add uh, carbon to the soil in a stable form such as charcoal or biochar, it takes a lot longer to be re-released to the atmosphere than it would if it was just wood rotting on the forest floor. Um, so the idea is that you can convert large amounts of biomass or sometimes, yeah, not always, not necessarily virgin forests, you know, maybe talking about waste wood, waste materials or kind of, you know, um, crop residues convert it into biochar, add it to the soil, and then that, that 
that woody biomass has removed carbon from the atmosphere while it's been growing and then it's stabilized that carbon in the soil so there's a lot of interest around kind of you know climate change mitigation which i think is really interesting and really valid and that i think it's really interesting and really valid but i would also add the kind of um, proviso that a lot of climate change mitigation stuff such as tree planting or, or other forms of kind of climate mitigation are, are, are very complex and the devil's sometimes in the detail. And it's not as simple as saying, yeah, bury this in the soil and, you know, it'll all be sorted. You know, it's kind of a complex field and there's lots of, lots of uncertainties about kind of long-term land use and long-term management and, and, you know, how it will behave in the soil. So um, it's interesting, um, but yeah, I think it needs to be kind of looked into closer. So yeah, that's kind of most of what I was going to talk about. I think um, I guess the uh, yeah the the conclusion is just that um, although there wasn't hasn't really been that much of a, of a thread to the talk, it's mostly just been me rambling. It's uh, I I personally find it really interesting to kind of see the way that charcoal has been a really crucial part of kind of human endeavour for so long and then to see it kind of also continuing into these kind of really new areas of human endeavour which are about you know how we can live on the planet sustainably and how we can kind of keep keep the show on the road without you know keep the environment going nicely and all that so quite quite exciting new chapter for charcoal really if anyone's got any questions please do fire in Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. So the question was, um, with with the kind of emphasis on um, clean air and kind of the, the concerns around uh, um, burning solid fuels and the, the smoke and atm atmospheric pollution that's caused of it, caused from it, and uh, the kind of emphasis on burning um, kiln dried or, or really dry wood, do do we see a situation in which at some point uh, wood burning stoves might be burning charcoal um, uh, in order to to keep the atmospheric pollution low, I guess. Uh, that's an interesting question. I haven't haven't really considered it, to be honest with you. Um, uh, I I do. Yeah, I'm not. It'll be interesting to see what happens with the wood wood fuel and and how much more you know because there is a there is a, a challenge around wood fuel. Um, how charcoal fits into that? I mean the. Um, at the moment, the cost of producing charcoal relative to the cost of producing wood is very high. So it, it would be, you know, there would have to be strong incentives for people to pay in order to generate all of their heat from charcoal, I think. But, um, but it would burn much, much more, much more cleanly. Um, I think also, you know, coal is still, still you know, clean, co clean, clean coal is still available, isn't it? So, and, and that also is probably still a lot cheaper. Um, you know, most charcoal in this country is produced you know, on a very small scale and the kind of, the overheads are quite, you know, the, the margins are quite tight on it really. So, yeah, but it's, it's an interesting question and, and yeah, quite possibly. I mean, just by chance I was looking at some sort of micro kilns. Have you, have you tried any of those? I uh, haven't tried a micro kiln, but I have heard the people that generate that made this the the retort that we're now using called the Exeter retort. Um, they have recently made a retort based uh, kiln that's based on um, a forty gallon barrel, which and that's and uh, having heard their description of how that works, that sounds really interesting and really effective. Um, so yeah, I, I, it, that's called the Welsh Dragon, and uh, would yeah, if anyone's interested in making charcoal on a small scale, I, I, it seems really interesting to me. Yeah, yeah. I think they said this was just even smaller than that. Right. Okay. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. I think that was that. Maybe a hookway? Was it called hookway retort? Yeah, I've, I've 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 come across the hookway retort. Yeah, there's lots of different um, models out there, and it's sort of still a bit of a uncertainty as to what the mark, you know, what people are going to settle on as the sort of most effective way. Um, but yeah, it's really interesting that people are getting into retorts. And people make them DIY as well. You know, you can make your own one if you're kind of that way inclined. Yeah. Have you ever tried an earth burn? Yes, we have tried earth burns. Yeah, we've done a few earth burns. How can you do 
You can do it on a small pile. Yeah, I've done an earth burn just using hazel sticks about that big, about two, three foot. I've done it about this big, yeah. and it worked absolutely fine. Any, yeah. any tips for doing one of them? Um, well, it, it, I, the thing about earth burns is it's, it's just guesswork. So much of it is guesswork. I think one thing that I realised was that with the earth burn, there was when we first started doing them, there was a feeling that you had to really exclude all the air. It was actually, I think that was maybe counterproductive. I think you want to exclude most of the air, but maybe have some small inlets at the base because you do need heat and you do need stuff happening in there. Um, so yeah, I would say don't be shy of getting some air in there and making sure it's chuffing away. Um, well, there's different ways that people make the chimneys. Sometimes um, you make a chimney by, when you build your stack, you put a central peg in called a motty peg uh, and that's kind of buried just six, six inches in the ground so it's removable. And then you build your stack of timber leaning up against that put your earth and, and your bracken or your grass or whatever onto grass first, then bracken, then earth or sods. And then once that's all built like a little pudding, you can pull the motty peg out and that's a chimney in the middle. And how, at what point do you close that office all day? So you then pour hot embers in down the middle, leave it off until you can see there's a good fire going and then put a big sod on the top. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> small one you could probably do in 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 a in, you know in in a day or in twelve hours or twenty four hours, but it's all about how much oxygen you're letting in, you know. Yeah. Yeah. That's our, yeah. That's our cool. All right. Nice one. But, um, yeah. Thanks, everybody.